Does every developer in your team have their own code style? Do you not like to work with other people's code because it looks ugly or unreadable? Have you tried adding a linter to your project only to run into a thousand errors or more? Do you want to actively try and improve a legacy system but are you unsure where to start? A linter is here to help. In this video I'll look at the what, why and how of linting. Let's get into it. So what is a linter? In the simplest terms, a linter reads code and then tells you things about it. It's called static code analysis. It's static because it doesn't actually execute the code, it's just reading it. And it's analysis because after reading the code, it comes up with insights about the code. It tells you things like warnings and errors, it gives you advice. And the fact that it doesn't execute the code can already give us an ID of where it's useful and where it's not useful. Linting cannot tell us whether the code will work. Same way, type system cannot tell us whether the code will work. You'll have to run the code for that. That's outside of the scope of a linter. But there's many conclusions you can draw from not running the code. And this is where a linter is very useful. It gives us insights, IDs, and it points out weaknesses of our code. And with those insights, you can then decide what to do. Most often, you'll want to update your code to fix a problem make the warning or error go away that way. But if you really want to, if you would really have a good reason to, you could disable a warning or error completely or just for this one use case. Linters do two things. They're concerned with formatting rules and with code quality rules. Formatting rules are literally the visual code style that you're seeing, where you put your tabs and spaces and indenting and do you use single double quotes, how long are your lines? I'll look at a few. Code quality rules are Potential bugs are best practices, anti-patterns. It's pointing out things that could lead to errors. That's the thing you want to catch. This last category is more important, but the first category will also help a lot. But there's more competing tools for this, like Prettier and Standard.js are very good at doing formatting, so maybe you don't want to use a linter for that. Let's look at the examples. I have three formatting rules here. Max len, no mix spaces and tabs, and keyword spacing. Max length is literally maximum line length. So there's some configuration here. Uh, this code would be a line that's too long if you would have a maximum length of 80 characters. This code would be okay because it has a line length of less than 80 characters. Note that these comments are just here for documentation. They would actually be located somewhere central so you wouldn't have these comments in your file. Another one is no mixed spaces and tabs, which is basically disallowing mixed spaces and tabs for indentation. It is literally what it says it does. If you have tabs um, mixed with spaces, it will complain. It will just tell you this is not okay. This is incorrect code. You can hardly ever see them, but they're there. Um, and it will allow uh, just using spaces or just tabs. You can configure which one it is. The next one is keyword spacing, which is literally spaces around keywords. Keywords are, are if, else, try, catch, all, all these things are all keywords. And you, you have to specify spaces around them in a certain way for ESLint in this case to uh, allow to not error on the rule. This again, these three are very much formatting rules. They're not potentially catching bugs. They're telling you how your code should look. But again, this category of formatting rules, I think is best dealt with by a formatter so that you don't have to do the spaces right. You just, you just have a prettier or standard JS plugin in your editor and it will just out of format all your code so you don't have to think about it. Next, let's look at three examples of code quality rules. No unused vars, which is again, disallowing unused variables. So any variable that you define with a const let var statement, but you are not using, or um, a function parameter, an argument that you're not using in your, um, in your function body or in your class or whatever, these things will then fail. It says here, uh, variables that are, not, that are declared and not used anywhere in the code are most likely in error. Such variables take up space in the code and can lead to confusion by readers. So it's a best practice not to have them. No implicit globals, disallowing declaration in the global scope. This is because of the history in JavaScript where it's possible to declare a variable without using the var, let, or const statements. You can then implicitly, without literally stating this, has to, this will become a global, you can implicitly create a global almost as if it's by accident create a global. This is, uh, if you always use uh, var let const, this is not possible anymore, but it's good to realize that there's always this rule protecting you from making that potential mistake. 
And the last one is prefer promise reject errors, which is requiring error objects as promise rejection reasons. So you can give a string as a promise rejection reason, but it will prevent you from being able to get a stack trace, for example. Error objects have a reason for their existence. And this, it is a best practice to use them, and this rule will fail if you don't. And there's really no downside to using error objects here. It's very simple. It almost takes no code to actually generate an error object. So why would you use a string if it has only disadvantages? It's a simple mistake to make, but this rule will prevent you from mistaking the, making this mistake. So a linter is very useful to increase code quality. It promotes good practices. It points out the anti-patterns, and it potentially even catches bugs. So that is why we lint. A linter gives us consistent code style, increased code quality, and potential error detection. Let's look at a few example scenarios to see why this is true. Imagine a situation where the entire code base is in a single style. It will make everybody quite fast at reading code because all the files look very similar in style. As developers, we read code all the time. When developing new features in existing code bases, when refactoring, when pair programming, when doing code reviews, when readability is very high, friction is very low because all the code looks like it could have written by you. Now imagine one file is in a different code style and you have to work with it. You have to fix a bug, you have to refactor it. It will take you more time to read this code, to understand this code. You're even likely to make more mistakes because it's a style you're not used to. It might take more effort, there's more friction. You will want to do this a bit less. You probably like to work on the other stuff because that looks familiar, that looks closer to you. This is human nature. And now imagine a worse situation. All developers have their own code style and you're all committing to the same code base. Again, it's harder to work with a style you're not familiar with. This will cause more friction. You'll want to work with that code base less. This will effectively lower quality because as I've explained in many of my previous videos, quality is very much achieved by talking about code, by working with other people, by pair programming, by code reviewing. That is, all of that is reading code. If there's more friction to do that, you'll want to do that less. We optimize for the path of least resistance. If you like to work with that specific style and there's a few files in that style, anytime work in that section of the code comes up, you'll jump at the opportunity to work with that because that's the stuff you have worked on. Suddenly you start to own these files. Suddenly other people will want to work less with these files. The quality, the shared code understanding, the shared code ownership is hurt. The business is hurt by this. This is a very bad thing. And now imagine the worst scenario. None of the developers have a consistent style. Everybody solves their problems and builds their features with Stack Overflow and Copilot and ChatGPT and all of it is in a different style. This means the cognitive load for everybody is quite high when reading code. And remember, reading code is like the principal skill, the thing you need to do a lot if you want to reach high quality code bases. We're not just building a feature, we're building a system, we're building a thing that it must last. And therefore we must invest in quality. If you don't like to read code, you can never achieve quality. So lots of bugs will fall through. A year from now, you'll have to rewrite the system because parts of it have become so complex and intertwined and a big ball of mud that you cannot get any work done there anymore. And this is a future we need to prevent. Now, this video is about linting, but code consistency is helped a lot by using a formatter like Prettier or Standard.js. You can even tell ESLint to validate whether you have formatted your code in the right way according to Prettier or according to Standard.js. This is definitely something I recommend. So use a linter. There's basically no downside to having a linter. There's only a downside if you have a lot of code but no linting yet. Then it can have a cost to introduce a linter because you have suddenly a lot of warnings or errors that you would need to fix. But it's still worth it and at the end of this video I even have a strategy for solving that kind of problem. So how to use a linter? I've got an example project, my static website that I built five years ago in some old Gulp script. It's probably going to fill some linting errors now. I never used ESLint there, so it, it's a nice example to, to pry around with ESLint. Installing ESLint is a question of running this command. I simply copied this from the website of ESLint. It will ask me a bunch of questions, which I can use to configure my project. 
I will only check syntax and find problems right now because this video is about linting and not about formatting, but I would recommend you enforce the code style as well on your project. So I'm using CommonJS because I'm not this project's five years old. I'm not using React or Vue. I don't use TypeScript. This is a browser context. Another note context. I would like to use JavaScript. And I would like to install this now. Yes, I use npm. There it goes. And we're done. Okay, so it has generated a config file for me. Uh, I could see, I can see right here what it came up with. It it basically answered all these uh, all these questions that I answered. It it put them in the configuration file, and it has obviously added the ESLint dependency itself. Depending on what you answered, it may have added other dependency like ESLint React plugins or stuff like that. Uh, but for now, let's let's keep it simple. So I can run ESLint with this command and see what errors it comes up with. It has these two errors right now. Apparently I'm using an unused var. Uh, MIME is, I guess, a package that I'm using that I'm that I'm not using, but that is specified in my package JSON. And I'm using the has own property from a target object and not from the globally available object prototype. So I guess this might be a security issue that it came up with. Let's try and fix it. So in my gulp file, I have this MIME package. I simply delete that and also uninstall that, of course, because I don't need it anymore. I probably used it in the past. And you already noticed that it has given me these warnings in the editor as well, in Visual Studio Code. That is because I did install the ESLint plugin, which I recommend you do. Then you get these warnings that you've just seen in the terminal, you also get them directly in your editor, which will speed you up. So let's look at this error. We have a has own property and it is used on the target object instead of on the safer objects prototype. So let's copy this line and let's see what we can do. So has own property should be called on this object prototype and I should call this, I guess like this. Now I have content types and content types, so it might be a bit confusing, but now I'm using this safer has own property call. So let's run ESLint again. And now it succeeds. And that's it. This is the basic principle. ESLint consists of plugins and rules. Those are the two most important concepts. Plugins you need for specific frameworks, like if you use React, you need to install ESLint plugin React. If you use TypeScript, you need to get a specific TypeScript way of setting up your ESLint, and this is done through plugins. And rules are the things that are failing. And rules can be set as a warning or as an error. If you have some things that you think you want to do, but are not necessarily so important that you need to enforce them, you can make them a warning so that the commits you're having isn't like a blocker. You can still move on with your code. It's just a slightly lower quality of what you want. But if it's an error, then it will actually block for you. So there's a difference there. I would recommend putting everything to error when possible and nothing on warning because it will increase the code quality for you. I would only recommend using warnings. If there's too much to fix at the same time, then some things can become a warning and slowly you can work your way through this pile of laundry that still needs to happen, so to say. Next, set up your editor, set up your IDE. You want those warnings, those errors that ESLint comes up with, you want that in your code directly underlined in your editor because it makes a lot more sense. It's a lot easier. You get a quick feedback cycle. You immediately have the problem while you're thinking about how to solve the problem. If you compare the feedback cycle to what it would look like in your terminal is that you suddenly have a list of things to fix. And that is a lot less likely to actually happen. It's a lot more annoying to do that kind of thing. If you remove the friction for yourself, it will be easier to actually do that work. The next step is running your linter before you commit. Git has the feature of pre-commit hooks, and that literally means what it says it does. The moment you start committing, you can run a script pre-commit. Then you can reject code that is not compliant with ESLint. If ESLint fails, you can block the commit from ever happening. You are forced to fix it. This is something as a team you can decide to 
even in the moments where you can't be bothered to actually fix it, you will be forced to fix it, which is a good thing. And the next step is in your continuous integration pipeline. Again, you want to block code from being merged, for example. If you look at GitHub or GitLab, they have features where you can say, if this pipeline fails, if this runner, this test, this whatever fails, then it is not allowed to merge this merge request, which I think makes a lot of sense. It's the same thing. You're blocking bad code from entering your code base. These pre-commit hooks and, and build server things, they're a slower feedback cycle. So you always want to do your editor integration first because that's the moment where you can prevent code from ever entering that second stage where it will be, it will give you feedback, but it will take a longer time. So you're less likely to fix it. And the last step is to fix all the warnings and errors. If you've just installed ESLint newly on an existing code base and you get a whole bunch of errors, what is that number? Is it a thousand errors? Is it a hundred errors? Is it 10,000 errors? What's going on there? My recommendation, if it's less than thousand, fix them right away. It sounds like a lot, but a thousand is actually not that much because many of them will be duplicates. Some of them may even be able to be fixed automatically. ESLint has a fix option for you where they can just edit your code for you. If it's 10,000 errors or more, you need to come up with a plan. This is a multi-day effort. You'll need to coordinate with your team, with your product owner, with your architect, with whomever is there. The first step is to turn every error into a warning so that you can still commit. While fixing your code, other people should not be blocked by it. They should still be able to add value to the software. They immediately want to do that without adding new problems to the system, but you don't want to be blocked by it if it's that much errors. So you have this option. A warning will not block you from committing your code, an error will. So let's turn all the errors into warnings first. Then you want to do some analysis on the output. Let's not look at the number of errors you have. Let's look at the number of unique errors. So how many rules are actually failing? Not how often is a single rule failing? And then you want to look at this list and prioritize it. You want to, some of them may be security issues. You want to put them all the way up in terms of priority because they may become a security problem in the future. Some of them may be code styling issues that you can even turn off or maybe you can use a formatter here to fix those problems away from you. There's definitely optimizations you can make. Then you want to figure out how much work they are. Some rules might have a super quick fix and some of them require some thinking. Maybe you even need to get together as a team. How do we want to solve these problems from now on? Come up with a solution and then start implementing it however often you get the actual error or warning for that specific rule and then prioritize the list, order it by priority. Decide with your team, at what pace do you want to fix all these problems? Because you do need to fix them. The only question is, do you want to take a few days, a sprint, a few weeks? Do you want to take a month? But you do need to fix them. Make sure at that point to also set the rule, all new code is committed according to the new code style. So new code that is written, being written right now has to be validated with the new ESLint rule. We're not going to make the problem bigger. We're going to apply the Boy Scout rule every time we touch something. At the very least, we leave the playground better than we found it. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but it's worth it. We can't only be building features or fixing bugs. We need to be building systems that will last. A linter will help you do that. To summarize, a linter is very useful in keeping code quality high and cognitive load low. Make sure you use one and keep the feedback cycle as short as possible. Install the plugins in your editor. Make sure you add the pre-commit hook, install it in your CI CD pipeline. And when onboarding new people, make sure it's in the documentation that these plugins in your editor are actually installed. Go around the team, make sure everybody has actually installed it right now so that you actually make the problem go away slowly. You're not adding to the problem. The problem is not secretly becoming bigger. No, you're chipping away at the problem. And that's it. I hope you liked it. I hope this was useful. If you have any thoughts or you have a request for a future video, let me know in the comments and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.